Love your music. So uh, ever since what was the first one, Translucent Space came out, and I, I was also on Fresh Sound then. And you know, I, I think I bought every record of of the guys who were on Fresh Sound also. So it's like you know, it's uh, yeah, we're like kind of part of a, a family, right? There, yeah, I really like that. The, 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 especially that years, like from two thousand two thousand eight, what Fresh Sound did. I love that stuff. It was so good. Yeah, you know, the Ivan stuff, uh, Opswigs, the overseas, and all that. It's su su such beautiful projects. I mean, um, yeah, Jordy's really cool. Jordy's awesome. Yeah, uh, and basically that's where I'll start. <laughs> What's happening with you and uh, a new record by you? I mean, I love your stuff. I love the last one with the trio with Cameron and Gerald, and you know, I, I just want to start with asking you first: Where are you standing as a band leader now, and when can we expect something new or that's a really good question. Um, sometimes I ask myself that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I uh, I sort of resisted the um, the self potentially self imposed expectation of having to put out records all the time, and uh, I, uh, I I I I love I love being a part of other people's projects, and I yeah. feel really like like I can. Uh, I don't know, I feel really comfortable in that sort of situation. And then when it comes to being a leader, it's been a lot more of a challenge for me to try to figure out how to to create a vehicle that would be existent in a way that's that's going to allow me to kind of feel the same mm. way when I'm improvising that I do when I'm playing with other people. Yeah. So it's like kind of been this puzzle that I've sort of slowly been trying to trying to figure out um but i uh i have been working on stuff and i'm just like i'm just taking my time with it you know i've been taking my time and i don't want to rush it sure. so i sort of have like i have a whole bunch of ideas but i really have like two kind of projects right now one of them is the trio with with gerald and cameron Oh, you, you guys still did gigs with this one? I mean, you still do occasionally? It's been a while. Okay. I haven't done anything as a leader since COVID. Yeah, okay. Um, and once playing started up again, I, I got, you know, I started playing with other people and their yeah. bands. And uh, so I've been, I've been pretty busy lately doing that, and I haven't had a huge amount of time to focus on my own stuff. But on the side, I am writing and conceptualizing, and <clears throat> I hope to record with the trio uh, sometime next year. Oh, beautiful, man! I love the trio. Seriously, that's that's such a good trio. It's so it's so it's so <sighs> cool. You know, Tony Malaby kind of planted the seed in my in my head a little bit about that. Oh, how come? Well, you know, I he knew that I played with Cameron a lot, and I I played in Cameron's band, and and we sort of did other projects together, and he played with me, and so I I was out somewhere, and and I saw Tony, and we were we were just rapping about stuff and and he said oh man how's cam doing and like ah oh, it's been a minute i think he's cool and and tony said that he did this this i don't know if it was a last minute thing but he did this like short east coast tour where they all crammed in cameron's little hatchback oh wow and it was gerald cameron and tony and they went up to boston and they went up to rochester and, oh. and he said he had written some music for that and how fun it was and i was like wow I know those two guys are from Detroit and I think they would sound really good together. And so that's kind of how it started, you know? Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been really amazing playing with those guys. And, and a lot of times yeah. I sort of feel like I can just like wind them up and let them go, you know, cause they just get into this thing. That's, I don't even know. I can't even describe it. It's like this magic, you know, Yeah. they have together. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. I forgot what the question was, but <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I, I, I love. You know, I mean, I play, I played with Gerald a little, and we did some recording and touring, and it's just like his time is so flexible. And you know, Cameron comes from that old school, 
vibe and when they play together it's just like and then you know you, you when i listen to the tunes you wrote for the trio and the improvs you just float over there on top yeah and it sounds so easy <laughs> you know it's yeah i mean it, it i love it, it it's so it's so it feels like it's so fertile it's like yeah wow, you know like there's like it's it feels just really like multi-dimensional mm -hmm. yeah you know you know what it's like yeah, yeah beautiful I love it. <laughs> So I'm mean, looking forward to exploring more with with those guys, um, but it has been a minute since we played. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted speaking of Cameron. How, how did you meet Cameron actually? Because he's um, like you know really older, like two generations. Like I mean, kind of. Yeah, um, I I got asked to. Oh, you know what? I'm there's this really great drummer, really good friend of mine named Rich Huntley, hmm. um, oh. and I had met him. And we just kind of clicked right away and I love playing with him. Really interesting drummer, really cool. Like we had some great hangs and like, he's just a really great, great person. And he somehow knew Cameron. I don't remember how they knew each other. And anyhow, Rich was finishing up his master's degree in Manhattan School of Music. And he, he asked me to play on his recital and Cameron was on his recital. So that was the first time oh, I met okay. was on that recital. And and I, you know, I mean, I'd heard him, I'd gone to hear him play with Lovano. And so he was sort of this like iconic figure, you know, and, and I knew about all of his work with, with, with Danny Richmond and Don, Don Poland and George Adams and that super famous, important band that, that he was such an integral part of for so long. Yeah. Um, so it was sort of like, whoa, I can't, I'm going to get to the camera around. Oh man, this is really cool. And then when I, uh, when I asked him, you know, if he wanted to be a part of my first record and he was into it, it was sort of like, wow, you know, it was really <laughs> and he was great. He just brought this amazing energy, you know, and, and yeah. as you know, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how I got to, to meet Cam. And now, now we're, we're, I consider him a really good friend. Mm. Such a, such a beautiful guy. Yeah. Amazing. What about Gerald? I mean, Gerald, I met on Ivan Opsvig's first. Oh yeah. Overseas, overseas. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think kind of cross paths a little bit here and there, and then yeah, yeah, the, and they haven't played together before your trio record, right? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think, I think that Malibu tour was. Oh the yeah, only except that one, yeah. But except otherwise, no, right? Yeah, is recorded. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's 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 it. Which Quite is cool. Deep, you know, like those guys are like, you know, they, when they got together, they just started like acting like they were old friends, like talking about old Detroit, and, and I was like, wow, this is. This is cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. You mentioned two projects you're thinking about for the future. Like one is the trio and what is the other one? The other one I think is probably a quartet project, but um, it's not it's not done yet. So I'm not really, it's probably going to be that. Um, so I kind of have to see how, I have a bunch of tunes started and composition started and and some of them are more further along than others. But like I said, I'm like, I, I'm not really pushing it. Like, uh, yeah. I've been really busy the last couple months, so I haven't really been able to put a lot of time into it. But uh, the next next month or so, I'll have a little more time. Hopefully, I'll, Fantastic. I'll get that going. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I know I haven't. I, some, some of my students are ragging on me because they're like, man, you don't put out a lot of records. What's up with that? <laughs> Do I have to? Like. Can I just put a record out when I want to, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's like too many records out anyway. It's, if you yeah. think about it, it's such an overload. But I mean, you know, I've been listening to, like I said, to your playing, and it's, you know, even on the last Mark Giuliano record, it's amazing what you play, you know, it's, it sounds so, uh, so effortless. And, and, I, and I wanted to ask you, like, you know how how do you deal with Mark's compositions and make it sound so fluent? Let's say that tune, most important question, right? <laughs> Which is like, I mean, there's there's a lot of shit going on there. So how how do you how do you make yourself comfortable and then deliver like this burning solo that sounds so easy? How how did you do that? Well, first you of know? all, thank you. Um, uh, so. You know, I, uh, I, I've known Mark for a long time. Like I first started playing with him in his, in his band here. Mm -hmm. I replaced the original saxophone, um, 
synth player that was in, in the group. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I've played a bunch of his compositions that have slightly similar characteristics to that oh. song. Like this song, you know, the most important question has this, this really, um, insistent, uh, sort of ostinato yeah, pattern going on. Yeah. Right? yeah. And there's an energy that Mark and Chris Morrissey on bass, th those guys have a really, really deep connection and, and they can play like an ostinato pattern together and it doesn't necessarily change that much, but there's something about the way there's an energy that builds in the way that they do that. So I get, I'm lucky in that I can sort of tap into that. Um, and, but that particular song, I have to say was additionally extra challenging to play mm. on because it was this like specific thing. And it's like, okay, well, I know that what I do, I'm not going to be getting like necessarily a huge amount of stuff thrown back at me because they're kind of into this, this thing. And so I kind of like, I kind of like started experimenting a little bit with, um, you know, you know, John O'Gallagher, the great alto. Oh, player. oh man, sure, I played with him. Yeah, I, I love John. Yeah, he, he he's he's one of my one of my good friends. I haven't seen him in since he's moved away, but um, yeah. you, you know, he, all of his work that he's been doing with with um, everything. I have all of his albums. I, I love his stuff, man. I'm he's one yeah. of the most under, underrated sax players ever. Really, totally. He's like, like, seriously, one of the baddest dudes out there. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. And so he he he's been working on um, late Coltrane theory. Yeah specifically with the uh, uh, 12 tone music uh, concepts. And, and so he, he sent me this uh, first version of his first book. Yeah, I also got it. Yeah, the PhD he yeah. sent me. Yeah, so I love it. The tricord thing, it was like, whoa, it totally opened up this whole channel of creativity that, that you know, I, I re hadn't really explored before. So there, there's, there's a lot of like that kind of opening that door. Hmm. Because there's so much, like there's so much fascination and stuff to be discovered, discovered just within those concepts. So yeah. I was like, this is this might be a really good opportunity to like see if I can kind of like just open that my own sort of discovery on top of what those guys are doing, instead of like waiting for them to or feeling like uh, unfulfilled in a way because they're not giving me stuff back, even though that's yeah. that's just like a you know. Uh, a weakness or whatever to feel like, oh, they have to reply to me, you know. Um, but anyhow, that 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 was kind of like one of the mental devices I was thinking about on cracking into that tune. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is Mark very specific as a band leader to to you guys? I mean, let's say to you as a horn player, what he wants you to do, or you have like a carte blanche when you when you play. That's except question. except the hats, I mean, of course. But, Mark is um, <clears throat> Mark is really smart and he's really naturally musical, and he 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 has this quiet confidence with his compositions, mm. and he's specific about things, but like in a way that that the that the music needs. Yeah, and if he's ever specific with me, it's more like in the context of how the piece is going to build yeah but usually he kind of just lets me do what i do and in fact when i first started playing with the jazz quartet you know we had played for years a number of years with hearing and hearing was like whatever you know like i'm coming into it and it's like super loose and um but with the jazz quartet i was like oh okay you know and i even asked him like after i don't know a few gigs i was like you know, do you want me to like play like this or like this? And he said, he said, I want you to play like you. Be I hired you because I trust your instincts and I mm. trust the decisions that you're going to make. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of both. Like if there's any like directing, it's like, you know, let's, let's save the heat for this part of the, of the piece. Yeah. Uh, or yeah i mean he's not really like he doesn't really tell me tell me what how to improvise 
you know, th there might be some suggestions about the overall arch of, of a piece, but yeah, it's kind of carte blanche. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, because I listen to the records that he does, and it's 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 like you know, well structured. It makes sense. It's an arc. Yeah, and even yeah, to I, the I, gigs, of course, it's like yeah. Yeah, I love that about his like he has his each of his pieces has like a, a strong idea, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. And you know, like sometimes I don't improvise on it, but I. I it, it, it's I love being a part of all of it. You know, it's 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 really cool. And he has these beautiful. Some of the tunes have these really beautiful soaring melodies, and and like sometimes he's like quirky little rhythmic things. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I love that. But man, he's got, he's got such a confidence and such a concept that it's 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 always like it's such a highlight to play. Yeah. With that, that group. What was the connection that you connected with him? I mean, how did he get to know you actually? It's a really, really funny story. Um, so I used to play, um, I was, I play flute and clarinet. And so, um, you know, shortly after I finished my master's degree, um, living in New York, I, you know, I was, was trying to get some work. And uh, one of the things I did was I, I started sounding people about subbing on Broadway shows. And and so I was subbing on an off-Broadway show, and then I was on subbing on a Broadway show, and then through some connections, I started subbing on the Big Apple Circus, which is an actual circus. It's a one-ring circus. It was started in Manhattan in the '70s, and oh, wow. every year they did this. That's so cool. Every year was a different show, and they always had a live band, and the band was awesome. And so through the grapevine, you know, my name got into the mix and I got a call to come and start subbing and the bass player um yeah boy Cole is what he he goes by um really really phenomenal electric bass player he was playing in the circus band as well and we hit it off right away and one day we were the the circus was at Lincoln Center mm, so wow. it's the tent set up at Lincoln Center like near the outdoor band show wow. and we were playing and you know like the the book I was playing had a little bit of improvising in it. And after the show, he says to me, he's like, man, I really like the way you play. I think you should join my band. What? What? Okay. And and he walked me over to Tower Records. There was a Tower Records there at the time. And he bought, he, he went, the record was being sold. There was, it was the Heerent record. And so he's a bass player on that. And he said, this is my band. And, you know, this is, I, I play with, with my friend, Mark. He's a really great drummer. I think you guys really get along. And, and I was like, cool. And I listened to the record. I was like, dude, this stuff is awesome. I totally <laughs> want to do it. So he was the connection to the band. And so he introduced me to Mark. So basically I met Mark because I was playing in the circus. <laughs> Which is nice. That's quite cool, actually. <laughs> but I feel like, I mean, I'm sure we would have met each other, you know, at some point along the way. But it's kind of, I kind of, I think it's kind of cool that that's, that's how it was. Hmm. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, associate you together first, like it kind of you know especially the, the early record that you did the early stuff the sage and the, the translucent space and then the music you play with mark now I, now it makes sense if you know what i mean now i hear the court it's like oh yeah sure it's yeah. a natural fit but in the beginning i would i would never like no. i don't know why but... i know yeah i know it's like it's like we're sort of like in a way you would think that we're kind of like exist in different circles which mm -hmm. In some ways we do, but um, um, I don't know. Like, I feel like I feel like I've always been interested in a lot of different kinds of playing energies, and you know, like I did a lot of big band playing. Like, um, mm. some really great composers in New York I played with. Um, I, you know, I sub with the Vanguard band, and oh, really? just oh, wow. super fun and. Um, and then, like you know, playing with with my really good friend Jeff Davis, who's a great drummer. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, yeah, and that you know, like all the people that sort of associated with Ivan and Gerald. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's I, that, I guess I, I I see what I see I see what you're saying with that. It would be like hmm, that's an interesting how do yeah. those two ends of the spectrum meet? You know, but um, yeah, it's cool. And and that bass player. Uh, Cole, well, Cole, when I first met him, his name was Neil. And then, um, but now he goes by Yaboy yeah Cole. Oh. 
and he ended up becoming uh he ended up forming a band with uh some friends that he went to berkeley with and they they really like they were it was a glam pop band it was really really great called semi-precious weapons and they were opening for well they started lady gaga was opening for them and then they went on tour they were opening for her oh wow wow they, they moved to la and then he became he was in the band dnc with uh with joe jonas so he was like you know the musical director and playing bass with joe jonas and was on oh. tour with him wow. he's like he's a really he's a beautiful guy too like if you don't know his work he, he put out a record a couple of years ago it's just i have to check it out i don't know his stuff so yeah. beautiful it's he's such a he he's such a heavy person and uh his music is yeah 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 boy b-o-i-i-i -I -I. yeah boy cole it's okay just, well, i'll check it out i don't know so, so much good music out there it's just scary then i always when i do this interview someone tells me something i'm like man should i have to write this down and then you check out this guy who someone tells you and another universe opens of 30 musicians i'm like you know yeah. It's scary. It's scary. It's beautiful, but it is scary. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. He's he's worth he's worth checking out, and it's like, yeah. I I was I, when I first listened to it, I was I was in tears because it was so beautiful. I was like, wow, man, it's so deep. He's such a deep everything. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I want you know we talked about the trio, like format with Cameron and, and Gerald and. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your influences. You, you know, first thing when I think of a saxophone trio, I don't know. I love those records, Sonny Rollins trio, Life of the Village Vanguard, and Joe Henderson. And you know, I love the saxophone trio. That's for me like no disturbance for the horn lines to hear them. <laughs> so, but like, what, what were your like main main influences, I guess, or impetus or whatever triggers that you started to explore this improvisational saxophone world? Um, do you mean specifically with the, the trio format or just... No, just general? like in general, when you were, I guess, a teenager, what, what got you excited for for uh, this path? When I was nine or 10, I heard the 1939 Coleman Hawkins recording mm. of Body and Soul on the radio. And that was like... Wow, okay. That just destroyed me. And then the first <laughs> record I owned, which was, which was shortly after that, was a Sonny Rollins record called Volume One. Okay, yeah. You know, and that's probably still my favorite record of all time that's like i feel like that that's like my my backbone of everything i do is sonny rollins 50 1956 i think with mm. Mm. max roach it's it's yeah so um have, i mean he, heavy tenor influences sonny rollins and and then um somebody asked me recently if i if i could name my saxophone influences and i think i think they were like well it was definitely sonny rollins it was, it was definitely coltrane wayne mm. joe henderson dewey redmond dewey really oh well okay yeah. kind oh. of later though you know for me i sort of discovered him later um and and uh i really um i really got into joe lovano mm. you know uh i think when i was in college and when i was studying at manhattan school of music working on my master's degree i was i i took lessons with dick oates mm. wow okay amazing yeah Man, what a great teacher he was he was so so heavy and uh he he uh he was cool if i wanted to take a couple lessons with somebody else like so i because i asked him i'm like you think it's okay if I take a couple lessons with Rich Perry? Mm. He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, you set it up and I'll take care of it. You know, we'll just comp for our lessons. It's so cool. So the first lesson I took with Rich Perry, I went down to his apartment in the East Village, and and Rich is super mellow and and you know like down to earth. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, I don't really know what I can teach you. <laughs> okay. Um, and he's like, well, let me hear you play. And so I played a little bit, and he and the first thing he says, he looks at me, he goes. You got to stop listening to Joe Lovano. And I was like, whoa, dude, harsh, but so true, you know, like, cause I love Joe Lovano so much. He was, everything he played just spoke to me so deeply. And, and, and he said, he, he said that he had this thing with Joe Henderson where he was mm -hmm. so into Joe Henderson 
that he realized that if he didn't stop listening to Joe Henderson, he would never find his own voice. Hmm. And he said he put all of Joe Henderson's records in the closet and forced himself to not listen to them. And so I kind of like did the equivalent of that, you know, I'm like, okay, no more. And of course I would hear Lovano. I'd, you know, go, sure. go hear Ocean Trio was my favorite concert every year at the Vanguard. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, you know, so you can't you can't get away from it. It was always so like, oh man, I love love this. But I stopped studying his playing and I stopped listening to him afterwards. Um, and honestly, I think probably f through him, um, I started exploring Dewey's playing more. And mm. then, then once I became, um, once I started playing more with Cameron, then I became even more interested in Dewey's playing. Cameron and Dewey, you know, like I was really fascinated with Dewey's sound. I would ask Cameron about, man, how did, what, how did Dewey get at this sound? Like it's, it's so like giant. What did he do? And, and Cameron said, man, he, he, he practiced long tones all the time. I was like, wow, man. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, so he, he's definitely like a later influence, um, but, but very important nonetheless. Hmm. What about Ornette? Did you ever dig into Ornette? Or... Yeah, like late, when I was like um, mid-20s, I mm, started, okay. started digging into, into more Ornette. Um, and uh, when I was, you know, like when I was a teenager, m most of my listening was was like, you know, the Miles Quintets and Coltrane okay. Records and um, Winton Kelly. Um, uh, Mr. Gordon, he was another one. Um, I studied a lot of the language of like specifically like Hank Mobley's playing. Oh man, I love that guy. Yeah, Hank Mobley, yeah. man. Oof, so melodic. So melodic. So, melodic, so just yeah. like so much heavy language that was, you yeah. know, just, so, um, so it wasn't really until like after I had sort of dug into those players that I, I started exploring more of of Ornette and and Ed Blackwell and and Dewey, Don yeah. Cherry, you know, all these guys. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 what was it like for you when you know you finished? I think on Manhattan School of Music, you said like when you were on the open market. Let's put it. Like <laughs> what what were the first musical connections and the gigs you got? What what I mean, of course, it's a stupid question, but was it hard? To get yourself out out there and i mean how did you what was your process there i mean for a tenor a, saxophone player i mean for a saxophone player that's a really i mean that's a really good question because it's you know it's sort of like it's kind of a mystery in a way yeah you know how do you do it um and i met some really great players who became really great friends at manhattan school mm. um ivan being one of them and uh jeff davis being another one and you know we were in school with thomas morgan and mm. <laughs> another really great saxophone player is really one of my favorites is lauren stillman oh man i love lauren man Oof. he's such a wow, he's heavy such a nice um, guy also. yeah such a nice guy he's so funny yeah. um and and there was a guitar player in school uh scott dubois oh uh, that's how you hooked up with him okay i have those records by the way tempest yeah. and monsoon i love those records that's right yeah, yeah. so yeah. Lauren and I were in school together with Scott and um mm. so we, we so those were some some of the first performing opportunities that I was was doing was playing in Scott's band um but we were playing sessions all the time like I'm, sometimes I would be I would go and play I would play three sessions in a day like that's beautiful different. man yeah it was so amazing and then I started a trio kind of a collector trio with Jeff and Ivan and um, I ended up moving in with them. So the three of us moved, lived together and we would play. And then Jeff shortly thereafter met his soon to be wife, Chris Davis. So the four of us were living together and we would have sessions. We'd get up, have coffee, hang, and then we'd play. And Chris was really, um, active. Like she was almost possessed in a way of like wanting to just play with a lot of people and so she was really good about inviting people over so you know sometimes i'd be out and i would come back and there'd be somebody there playing and they'd be playing and i'd pick up get my horn and i start playing with them or yeah that's so cool 
so that was a really fertile amazing kind of thing that i didn't i mean i guess i didn't re realize it at the time i just sort of took it for granted um but that that kind of you know that made a lot of things happen there um and then you know i was i i was playing in a lot of big bands and i, I met people through that as well um reading a lot of really cool music and mm. uh yeah you know it just sort of i don't know it just it's, it t took a while you know it takes some people sure. it doesn't take that long but it took a while so i feel like i earned it the right oh, definitely way. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah definitely yeah um, it's a long process yeah <laughs> I, I mentioned in the beginning translucent space and uh how did that one happen i mean what's the story behind there like how, how did you get the con in touch with jordi and you know, Cameron, you mentioned, but, but like Mike, you know, I love Mike. He's again, one of the un most underrated greats talking about oh. underrated people. And, and, uh, but uh, how did that one happen? The, your debut as a band leader. So I had played on, um, Ivan's record. Just, I, I think I only played on one track. Yeah. And then, and then Chris Davis made a record that I played on. As yeah. Well. Li li lifespan, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I love them. Yeah. And then I couldn't believe it, but Jordy actually like reached out to me and he said, you know, I really like your playing on these records. Do you, would you ever want to do something? And and I was honestly, I wanted to ask him, but I was just too nervous. I was like, he's going to say no, you know. And here he is like asking me and I was, "Whoa. Yes. <laughs> please, yes, I would love to." Um and and so that happened uh really beautifully and and uh luckily in a way you know um and then and then you know since i knew that that was was an option and all of my friends were getting their projects together and and i was like yeah i got i gotta start doing this and so, so i just kind of started writing and and you know hmm. it, it it uh as you if you check out that record it, the fir first song has uh woodwinds you know the clarinet yeah, that one. Pro Proximo. Yeah, yeah. Proximo, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then I'll, there's another listen one today. Yeah. Just, uh, where I play just the Indian flute, you know, yeah. um, the bamboo flute, and and the, then you know, there's one. The last one is is um, my wife plays cello on that, and uh, you know, so it was like influences and people that I was you know really into the what they were doing, and I you know wanted to wanted them to be a part of it, and and I wanted to express some of that that writing. Yeah. Um, skills, uh, and then I'd also been playing with Mark Ferber a lot in 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 Scott Dubois' band, and Lawrence Stillman was the one. He said, "He goes, when you make a record, you you need to hire Mark because you guys <laughs> play really well together." And I was like, oh, man, he's bad. He's great. He's really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Mike, I met Mike playing. The first time I met Mike was subbing in the Vanguard band, doing a rehearsal, I think, with the Vanguard band, and uh, he's one of my best friends and. I love his music and I love playing in, in, you know, his, his different projects and, yeah. and I love his piano playing. He's, he, you're right. He's really, he's really underrated and he doesn't, he's a writer music. actually, yeah, a composer. Yeah. And he plays, he plays that way too. He plays very organically and like compositionally, you know, like very thoughtfully. Yeah. So that was, that was a really fun, fun project to put together. Did you lead bands before already in New York before you did that one or not really? think so no hmm. i think i no i don't think so i think it was always just sort of either collective things hmm. or playing other people's music you know um yeah but a, a lot of those things on that like that that first track proximo like mm -hmm. i lo i really like that yeah that thing and i would love to do more with that like i kind of like oh listen to that i was playing that for somebody the other day and and Cause we were talking about writing for wins and I was like, Oh, I did this thing, you know? And, and, and the way I did that was I wrote their parts out for the melody, but then I wrote out like 10 different background parts and they were numbered like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, one through 10. And as the, as we were playing, they got to decide which of the backgrounds they wanted to play at the woodwind players. And so it was oh. like, I didn't, I'm like, you guys can do whatever you want. You don't have to play any backgrounds if you don't want to. But, you know, and, and because it's just this loop of these two chords, you know, improvising. And so when they come in during the blowing section, that's them taking a, a compositional 
That's a cool idea, actually. That's a cool idea. I thought that was cool, you know, and then it's different each time you do it. Um, Yeah. But I like to. I would like to do more with that sort. That sort of ensemble. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's 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 a beautiful record. You know, it's like okay, sixteen years old, but still you put it on. It's like man, it's so, still sounds modern in a sense. I know. You I, know. I, I, I got to do another record. Yeah, I got. I got to do another one out there. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, the really ideas. It's just like the, trying to find the time to do it. You know, it's like oh man. Yeah, I know. I know. But d- did you feel comfortable immediately in the role of a band leader? Or was is is being a band leader for you a, a hard thing? Or I mean, it's it's not as easy. I'm not the kind of person who feels super comfortable being the saxophone, the lead voice, yeah. if you will, the horn voice in a band. Like, you know, like, um, I'm I would rather just sort of be in the back. Like, I almost feel like I should have been a drummer because, you know, like you can sit behind the drum set and you're sort of like, you know. You're always playing, mm. but as a saxophone player, like you know, I gotta, I gotta play the melody, and you know all the, and you, you basically like right out front, and yeah. so I don't really f- feel comfortable doing that, but I love it. I love playing, so it's like you know, um, so I, I guess yeah, like I'm a reluctant, in a way, band leader, but I chose the people to do those projects specifically because i felt really comfortable playing with them yeah it's important yeah 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 you know like feeling like i don't have to worry about anything like it's just going to be you know it's going to be cool i don't have to worry about somebody like trying to read what is what are they trying to tell me you know it's like no it's it's just yeah yeah yeah. that's so So important in music yeah great yeah it's so important it's so important yeah absolutely You know, we mentioned the tune Proximo many times and the other stuff on that first album, which is beautiful compositions that Southampton and what, what is 114, or I don't know, I remember what I listened to there, but like, uh, what's your process there when writing? And, uh, you know, how, how do you develop an idea or where do you get the idea? Actually, that's my most important question that I usually struggle with. Um. I am a little OCD, like, you know, I, I have, you know, I, I kind of like will count my steps or I'll count taps on my finger. I'm like, you know, whatever. I'm just sort of like, so, um, uh, sometimes I'll, it it manifests itself in like these sort of repetitive rhythms and, um, and that song one, one, four in a way was kind of like that. And, uh, I I'll fixate on things like that. And I actually, yeah, I really, I really like, um, minimum, minim, minimalist music. Like I love, um, a friend of mine in college played me this, um, this double CD. I forget the name of the record. I have it, but it was a, it was a Philip glass. Um, yeah, I can't remember what it was called, but, uh, it, it's it sort of just like, it really tapped. I tapped into that. It really spoke to me in a deep way. Um, and, uh, there's another really beautiful recording of a Philip Glass record I just thought of. Uh, it's, it's the, um, I think it's the Emerson Quartet mm. playing. It's called, it's, it's uh, some some pieces that he wrote. It's called Mish, the Mishima Quartet. Mm. Don't know. Um, okay. And it's like, I'm not sure if it was for a film score, a Japanese film score, or what it was, but um, really, really sort of dark, somber music. And mm. a- anyhow. Um, so that sort of fixation on like these little cycle patterns, like I really, that kind of like, you know, there, there's something with that, that I, that is satisfying. Um, so sometimes I'll write a, a song that's, that is kind of based on like an ostinato baseline that ends up becoming a baseline or like these rhythmic things. Um, as far as writing goes, like I watched your interview with John Hollenbeck and, um, He's he's so brilliant. Oh and, man, yeah, <laughs> he's so brilliant. Um, Claudia I mean, Quintet, the tunes, man, that's oh my god, yeah, yeah, it's so, crazy so, stuff. So intriguing and 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 amazing, and uh, I loved how he said that that he tries to think of different ways to compose, 
you know, like, because he wants songs to sound different, you have to compose them in different ways. I was like, whoa, that's a really, that's really deep, you know? And, and, and so then I started thinking like, well, how do I compose? Um, I don't have a, th he said he had almost a thousand. I was like, wow, that's, that's, yeah. that's I don't use um, software at all. Um, I, oh, okay. I really, I'm into pencil and paper. It's way better, man. And yeah. I, yeah. You know, there's something tangible about it. And you know, I, I haven't made that connection yet. Um, although I do have Ableton and I've been slowly learning a little bit. Um, but I really don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so I'll, I'll write uh, with the, my horn sometimes and I'll just kind of like come up with something and I'll, I'll jot it down and, um, or sometimes I write at the piano. Hmm. Um, it's usually, it's usually one or the other. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's both. Yeah. But uh, I do spend a lot of time at the piano and uh, you know, some, sometimes I'll like, if I'm practicing something and, and I, and I, and I came across, I'm like, Oh, what did I just play? And I'll write <laughs> it down and maybe it becomes an exercise, you know, I'm like, Oh, maybe that's something I want to practice more and, and expand it. Or like I'll come back to it and maybe develop it. Um, so there's definitely a lot from the saxophone perspective, but then also like pianistically as well. Yeah, yeah. It's I have sometimes problems how how to begin a tune, you know, and then always obsessed with yourself that you're repeating yourself and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of get rid of that feeling sometimes. You, I write a seven four pattern, and then I'm like, "Fuck!" I wrote that like two years ago, or something. Or maybe I shouldn't bother myself with that because if it comes yeah, out at a certain I, moment, I guess it must. I guess I don't know. But, yeah, like Chris Chris Morrissey said something that was like to me. He was like, "He's like, you know, he's like we can't we can't be too precious about what we do. Like, you know, like just write it down. It's an expression of the moment. Yeah. Maybe it's something that you wrote two years ago, but whatever, you know, like just put it down and leave it and move on. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's cool. So, you know, like he said that a few years ago and I was like, yeah, I'm going to try to be more like that. It's hard to be like that, but it is, you know, yeah. it's like, just trust yourself. Um, and then there's another, like Ernest Hemingway wrote this book called a movable feast and it's sort of semi, it's like basically it's autobiographical and um he's talking about when he lived in paris um after the first world war and uh he said that he when he was talking about having writer's block and he said that he knew that if he can write one true sentence that the story would that was the story that mm. he could he could let it unfold from there and and that's that's something that i've thought about too it's like okay cool if i can write one strong idea yeah I don't have to finish it, you know, right away, but if it's there, then I can come back to it the next day or the next week or like months later, you know, because and it's strong. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. that sometimes that's how things happen. Like I have, I have like these big, you know, uh, score, these big, uh, orchestral books of, of score paper that I keep around have like stacks of them. And, um, I just write, you know, like whatever, just write something down or, and, and, come back to it and so some of my songs have, have actually been developed that way um, yeah that's smart yeah it's it's good that you use the 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 pen you know since i started using a computer it's way less creative i think because then you actually sit down on a computer and like you know do the i used to write by hand but then i did an orchestra project and then I got addicted to Sibelius, <laughs> and it's like, fuck. <laughs> but yeah, I have to get back to using the handwritten. It's so much nicer, also. I, I've written a couple things on Sibelius, and and I know what you mean. Like, it's like, oh, you get into it. There's something, like, cool. Oh, man, this, you know, you get in. And then, but in the end, like, I felt like when I heard it, I was like, yeah, I was never really connected to it the way that I was when yeah. I was writing it, you know? I mean, some people have, have developed that and they're really amazing at that, but that's not me. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> the programs. I love handwriting. But yeah, good that you, you do know, it. I, I have a couple um, composition students um, and uh, they solely use programs. And, um, you know, I, I've had in the past some students who they don't really know much about harmony or orchestration, but yet they're writing string quartets. And, and I'm like, 
how do you know that do you know do you know that like do you realize that that's probably going to be kind of impossible for the cellist to do that and well it says i can do it in the program and, and if it goes too low then it'll show me a red line a red line yeah you know, it's like, wow it's i suppose there's a way you can learn that way but for me it's so boring you know i mean yeah. i'm old I guess i'm old school yeah. you're getting there right yeah, you're <laughs> approaching that age now like I know. I don't, feel, I, don't feel like, I don't feel it, but yeah, you're right. I am. <laughs> uh, I wanted to also, Jason, ask you just about this connection uh, with some people. Like, uh, how did you hook up with? I know with Scott Dubois, I have those records at home, but with Mike Bagara, I love his playing also. And I, I know you did a couple of records of his, and I think I have one at home, but I love that stuff. And how did you guys get together? Uh, there's a composer in New York uh, named Darcy James Argue. Oh, yeah. And I played in his band a number of times. Really? Oh, he wow. played at um, the, I think it was, it was, a, it was a, the Bowery Ballroom or somewhere in the Lower East Side. And Mike was in the band that night. And I, I'd, we'd never met before. And, and uh, we kind of clicked and I heard him play. And I was like, wow, this, this guy's really thoughtful and heavy. And, and then he kind of reached out to me after that and, and asked me to be, you know, play some sessions and then, and, uh, I, uh, he, he's heavy. He, yeah, I love, I love his stuff. Yeah. He, and he's so, he's so versatile and everything, everything he plays is super deep. And it's like, it always sounds like him and man, like, yeah, he, he's, he's great. I, I, I love playing with him. He, he, he moved to, um, Knoxville, I think Knoxville. Really? Knoxville. Oh wow! Okay. And he he now he has these these this band. Um, it's like uh, um, uh, I I'm blanking right here, but he, they just put out a new record, and I haven't heard the record yet. But uh, the last one they put out, Wall of Ro Wall of Flowers, Wall of Flowers, is heavy. Oh, Mike Watt and um, oh, I can't remember. I. I'm, I'm just blanking. I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. Yeah, check it out. Like, the stuff he's doing right now is is really, really, really heavy and beautiful. And, yeah. Oh, so, oh, big wow. band. Okay. I met him, met him big band. band. Yeah, New York. Yeah. Okay. Hooking up. Yeah. Cool. A lot of big bands in New York. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I just wanted to ask you otherwise, like, uh, what's, what are your plans for the upcoming months? Uh, I guess more touring with... Uh, Juliana Quartet and uh, or, or what other stuff? I mean, what, what's on the schedule? Yeah. Um, so uh, Mark has a, there are a lot of uh, tours coming up this next year with Mark's band, um, and starting at the end of January, we're we're gonna go. We're going to playing at the to Tokyo. Um, oh wow! Okay. In Tokyo, and then uh, we're also we're playing at the Winter Jazz Fest. In, in New York. Um, and there's another band that I've been playing with this really great um, composer, uh, Miho Hazama. She leads a group called M Unit. And uh, we are playing also with her group at the Winter Jazz Fest. And oh, beautiful. Then she's doing another record. Uh, she had a record that um, came out a couple years ago called uh, Dancer in Nowhere. I think that's what it was called. Really, you, pl you, play, you played on it or? Yes. yes. Oh, shit. I have to check it out. Okay. Really, really, she has a really interesting concept. It, the band is a string quartet, three saxophones, trumpet, uh, sometimes voice, not always, piano, bass, drums, and she wow. conducts. Wow. And she's, okay. She's so on it. She's like, re it's, she has really great ears and just like, she knows exactly what she wants to do and it's, it's really cool to play her music in that sort of like, it's like kind of a, a chamber situation, but yeah. there's also you know, kind of like push and pull. Uh, oh. it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's an interesting project. Let's so check it out. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, I really, really want to get back in the studio with, with Gerald and Cameron. And I have, you know, some, some stuff I think would be really cool. You know, that record one, the reason it's called one is we recorded enough material for three records <laughs> and Whoa. and we only put out enough for for one record and my really good friend colleen Chernowski, who did the cover art and she's done the cover art for all uh, all my records um 
she's a, a really old friend from high school. She's really amazing photographer and great person. Um, she said, why don't you just call it one and, you know, and, and one and then you put the next one out and call. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And then I, then I got self-conscious and I was like, I don't know if the other stuff is, you know, it's, I don't feel good about it. And, and so, you know, I it's just kind of sitting there. Um, but, but you still, that, still have the other stuff basically. So yeah. the other tapes, oh man, come on. Records worth. I could put it out, you know, but, but it's ba like band camp or stuff. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Oh maybe. man. Um, I want to record, I want to record with that, with that band. And then I want to finish this quartet project that I've been working on and, and I'd love to, I'd love to, to, to play with, with, with those projects, you know? Oh, so, sure. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. That, that could be a nice one to bring to Europe actually with, with Gerald and, uh, and Cameron. Yeah. It, it's a trio also. So that's easier to, to book and to travel and, you know, Absolutely. uh, and those guys are, I mean, they're quite Cameron, especially like he's a legend, man. You know, I think he played in Vienna two, two months ago with Sheila Jordan and yeah. It's yeah. So, Jesus. He's such a legend. I, I did, I did one tour in Europe as a leader and it was, it was shortly after, um, the second record came out and, um, it was with, it was with Mark Ferber and Cameron and Mike Holliver mm. and like, Everywhere we went, like Cameron was like he was the superstar. He was like, you know, it's so it's so. That's so cool. Oh, everybody, everybody knows Cameron, and, and that's and, so cool. Know, his work with Sheila Jordan, with you know, a lot of people is so important to them, and it's I mean, it's so important. And then of course the stuff in in Don Paul and, and yeah, George that's Adams, that's we'll talk about reverently, you know, yeah so heavy such a player yeah we do we and everyone yeah and, yeah. Yeah. yeah cool great jason oh i'll, I'll let pleasure. you let you be <laughs> yeah you too i hope we see each other in person soon yeah me too if you're in europe uh drop me a line and uh get together for a beer or whatever so i absolutely will oh cool great man stay strong mm -hmm.